Welcome to the new school and to the 2014 Henry Cohn Lecture entitled Public Policy in Action, Advancing Economic and Social Inclusion in America. We're thrilled to have you here in such a large crowd tonight for this important conversation. My name is Bryna Sanger. I'm the Deputy Provost here at the New School, and I'm really honored to be here tonight. Milano has been my academic home for many, many years, and my own scholarship has been so intimately connected to the subject of tonight's panel. As a teacher and as a policy and management researcher, my own work was to improve social and economic supports and management of programs and agencies serving the urban poor. So this keeps me deeply embedded in the work of Milano, uh, in the Milano School, and I'm, I'm delighted to be back home. Um, I'd like to thank Susan Halpern, our alumna, our university board member, and our devoted friend for making this evening possible and for so much more. Through her generosity, her commitment to social reform, devotion to the new school, it, it, it goes on. I would also like to, to thank the Milano School and um, also the Center for New York City Affairs for their significant contribution to ensuring that this kind of discourse remains central to the New School's legacy. As many of you may know, the New School was founded in 1919 and continues since its founding to maintain a deep commitment to research, teaching, and policy related to issues of social justice. Established in 2006, the Henry Cohen Lecture at the Milano School is named after the school's founding dean, who served from 1965 to 1983. He was my first boss. He was a colleague for a number of years. And Henry was a rare entrepreneurial uh, reformer. He came to the new school from a distinguished career in public service in New York City as the deputy city administrator in the Wagner administration and as the deputy administrator in the first New York City Human Resources administration. He founded what is now the Milano School and the Center for New York City Affairs to prepare a new generation uh, for careers as reformers like himself. What few knew about Henry, however, and which is relevant, I think, for what we're going to talk about tonight, was that at 23, he was appointed director of the third largest displaced persons camp in the American sector of post-World War II Germany, where he fought against discrimination in the army and for social justice for uh, concentration camp survivors. The Henry Cohen Lecture focuses on public policy challenges and solutions for women, for children and families, and particularly those in impoverished urban settings. Henry would have been proud to have had this lecture named for him if he were here today. Past Henry Cohen Lectures have consistently uh, addressed issues of inequality and poverty and also of social inclusion, and some recent uh, lectures were given by Jared Bernstein from the Center for uh, Budget and Policy Priorities, for, by uh, Myron Ornfeld, the executive director of the Institute on Race and Poverty at the University of Minnesota, <coughs> and by Jeffrey Sachs, the director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University. So this, this lecture series has a, has a long history and, a, and, and, and an illustrious one. This year, we're using the lecture series to do something a bit different and advance a new initiative. The special event serves as a precursor and a kind of kickoff to a new course being offered at the new school this spring. The course, Public Policy in Action, Advancing Social Equity in America, will be taught by three of tonight's participants, Professor Derek Hamilton, Juliet Ellis, and Milano Dean Michelle DePass. The course will examine how public policy can serve as a vehicle to advance economic and social inclusion in the context of evolving dem uh, demographic, economic, and political shifts in America. As a catalyst for an expanded dialogue with the community, this lecture brings together students, faculty, staff, and community members to discuss topics of policy and social justice beyond the classroom. And following in the tradition of Henry Cohen, the Milano School's new dean, Michelle DePass, has put forth a, a significant social justice initiative as a, a centerpiece of her new contribution to the Milano School. 
enriched learning and engagement opportunity, demonstrating our scholarship, innovation, and creativity, solidarity, and collective action, highlighting all of the new school's values. So this evening and the spring course are part of this uh, bigger undertaking here at the new school uh, where we'll continue our commitment to social justice and provide a space both for dialogue about these things and a showcase for our current work in the field. Uh, to talk about tonight's program, we'll consider the challenges faced by individual change makers who are sitting here among us, how public policy can reverse this trend toward inequality, and advance economic and social inclusion. Our panel tonight features distinguished public service leaders, and we hope they will inspire you, all of you uh, with how much they've advanced the equity agenda through policy. We're delighted to have Maya Wiley, counsel uh, to Mayor Bill de Blasio and founder of the Center for Social Inclusion, Fred Blackwell, the CEO of the San Francisco Foundation and former Oakland City Administrator, Juliet Ellis, Assistant General Manager for External Affairs at the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, uh, and former Executive uh, Director of uh, Urban Habitat. And they will be joined by two of our distinguished faculty members, Rick McGahey, who's Chair of the Environmental Policy and Sustainability Management at the Milano School, and Derek Hamilton, Professor of Economics and Urban Policy here at Milano too. They will serve as discussants. Uh, Milano Dean Michelle DePass will moderate, and I'm happy to introduce her to you to begin our program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bryna. Thank you. I want to offer if there's anybody in the back who wants to get a seat, there's definitely some seats here in the front and in the middle so that you can be comfortable and enjoy our conversation as we spend the next hour and a half together. So, um, Thank you to uh, Deputy Provost Brian Sanger and also a, a very dear member of the Milano community. Um, I've been really enjoying my time as a, a new dean at Milano uh, because Milano and, and particularly the Urban Policy Program really is engaged in training the next generation of leadership to be able to tackle these thorny issues and problems that we're going to be discussing tonight. So it's been quite a joy. Uh, Brian had talked a little bit about the Henry Cohen lecture and um, what we're going to be doing here tonight. But I wanted to start off with a quote from uh, H. George Fredrickson uh, in the State of Social Equity in American Public Administration. It reads, in our literature, in our classrooms, and in our administrative practices, we have learned to talk the social equity talk. But if the data on the growing gap between the haves and the have-nots in America are any clue, we are not walking the social equity talk. We're gonna hear tonight from three panelists who have definitely been walking the social equity talk. In their respective organizations, they have been strident and have amazing ideas about how to actually get things done. But that's the conversation that we're gonna have tonight. What can we really do? I'll allow them to share a little bit of their backgrounds just to get us started, and then we're gonna jump into a discussion on the opportunities for advancing an equity agenda. I think on the programs that have been distributed tonight, you have their full resumes, of which are long and very distinguished, so it would take about a half an hour out of an hour and a half to go through that. But uh, Bryna gave you some insight to uh, the intellect and the high-poweredness that we have on this panel tonight for the Henry Cohen Lecture. So let's start with you, Maya. You have been uh, in the trenches for quite some time. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and sort of what led you here to where you are today? Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here, and that's a really hard question. Um, in part because I think, and I suspect everyone feels this way, there's really not one thing that kind of results in a, in a career and in a body of work, particularly when you're doing something that's really about social justice. So I'm, I'm going to share um, two stories from my childhood, because I think they best indicate why I do what I do and how I got here. Uh, so one was that when I was very young, my father was an organizer, my mother was an organizer uh, in the civil rights movement. So that's fact number one. But the, the real story is, but I got a law degree and I grew up in a household where everyone wore buttons that said, I am not a lawyer. 
And that was a proud statement because lawyers just got in the way of the actual strategies being accomplished, which also always meant to violate the law, and the lawyers were always saying, don't. So, uh, you know, it was a big, like, aggressive and really radical act in my household to go to law school. But part of how I got there was one day my father organized welfare, uh, women on welfare, which for him was a strategy to bring, do multiracial organizing at the intersection of race and poverty. Uh, and so one, of the, one night, we, we were always sent to bed on time, and nothing in our house ever happened before we went to bed. Everything exciting happened after we went to bed. And so one night, you know, every, all, all of the, and the organization was all women actually on welfare who were organizing and fighting and creating the strategies. And one night, you know, my brother and I were awoken, and we shared a room at the time, we were really young, like maybe six, five. And, you know, we went downstairs and everybody was sitting on the floor talking and everyone was clearly very upset. You know, and we didn't really know why, and so we started doing what little kids do, which is, you know, you start sliding down the steps, like quietly on your butts, <laughs> hoping you don't get noticed, right? And, you know, we, and we got all, we never get all the way to the bottom. We got all the way to the bottom of the steps, and they, people were so upset that nobody ever actually stopped us and sent us back upstairs. So by the time we got, and then, and then once they realized we were there, they actually called us over to the circle, which was totally unheard of because it was like 10, p I don't know, it was really late. And it turned out, that as we were sitting there, all of these women were actually describing their experiences of having been arrested after the protest uh, and appearing before a judge who should have just released them on the misdemeanor of disorderly conduct. And instead, because he was ideologically opposed to the positions they were taking, decided to hold them there in court overnight and call them one by one onto the stand to publicly humiliate them. And I was not old enough to totally understand all of the substance of what they were talking about, but I was completely old enough to understand that there was something deeply, deeply upsetting about what had happened to these women who, who to me were like aunts, right? I mean, they were powerful and brilliant and you know, amazing. And, and at one point, everyone starts calming down and they turn and look to my brother and I and say, so what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a judge. <laughs> and everyone went, oh. and then he said, why, why would you want to do that? And I said, because that's where all the power is. <laughs> and somebody's got to let people go home to their kids. Um, and that was really, it, like, it, I actually wrote that as my law school essay uh, because it just stayed with me for my entire um, time through school. But the second thing that I think uh, is also personal stories. We lived in a low-income black neighborhood. It was called DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C., which should, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Fact number two, okay? Um, and I went to the neighborhood public school, which was, I was probably the only kid in the school that was not on welfare. And I was at the top of my class, and by second grade, I was two years behind grade level. And I went having learned to read on Bank Street school books before I even went to kindergarten. I had two parents, both with a minimum of, collectively, a minimum of eight years of graduate education, a black father who had a PhD from Cornell University in 1957 in organic chemistry. I did not meet the profile of the child that is two years behind grade level, having started school knowing how to read, right? All of that was a structural condition that had nothing to do with parenting and had nothing to, it had everything to do with the investment in the public education system. And for me, what it also taught me was I also understood why some kids do not perform and how it has absolutely nothing to do with the family. And so that all our discourse about opportunity and our, all of the ways in which we personalize and place blame, I could not in my very bones live with because I was too much, I had too much personal experience with having had all the advantages and being at the top and yet being two years behind. Thank you, Maya. Julia, you have, uh, like all of our panelists, transitioned around social justice from the nonprofit sector to the government sector. Tell us a little bit about your story and why. Um, what, do you, what do you think you uh, will be accomplishing and have accomplished in um, that transition? 
Well, and it's funny to have Fred Blackwell, who is one of the reasons why I transitioned into the public sector, sitting next to me. He's to blame. Um, so I, I like the idea of doing it from storytelling. And I think that for me, it's the story of how in my professional career and personally, the evolution of thinking about leadership. And so as um, Michelle had mentioned, so I ran a nonprofit called Urban Habitat, which is a social and environmental justice organization for 10 years. And when I took over the organization, I was 29. Um, and you know, had we, the organization had a leadership institute with a goal of training low-income community members um, and communities of color um, to be in leadership positions and to kind of lead campaigns. And the evolution of that program in particular during my, my time at Urban Habitat, you know, initially it was created to really invest in um, leaders from throughout the region because we were a regional organization based in Oakland. And so you'd have like 18 different leaders coming through this academy that we had. And it really was from an individual basis of like, what are the skills that folks need to actually be effective in leadership positions in their local communities? Um, but over time, when you tried to really get the sense of, you know, and the urgency around the, the things that were happening in communities around crime, around education, around disinvestment, you know, our leadership program just wasn't having the impact. And so, you know, we all paused and we're just like, okay, we're gonna reset. And so then we changed the leadership program and we're like, okay, it, it needs to really invest in individuals that are working on particular campaigns because that will give us the traction that we need for impact. So it's not gonna be just random Joe on the corner, it's gonna be Joe who's leading a just cause campaign or a housing campaign, et cetera. And how do you support them to be effective in that particular campaign? But again, it's like the issues that were happening in the community continued to, you know, we would hear from moms who are working on transportation issues and be support that individual mom. But then you would hear them say, it's like, you know, we keep getting truancy letters from the school because we don't have the money, the buses don't come, there's not a public school bus that comes. And so when the, we, you know, we have no access to be able to get our kids to school when we can't pay for a taxi, we're getting these truancy letters. So we tried that campaign style of just, but again, the frustration, especially when you're doing social justice work of the urgency around these issues is so big and you're not getting the scale of impact. So then we really paused and pivoted and we're like, okay, we should really be focused on who has power. Is it a judge? But in our instance, it was really focusing on what we thought were the decision makers and policy makers. So we ended up launching a program and uh, changing the leadership investment to really focus on elected officials and um, decision makers. And we focused and piloted this in the city of Richmond, which is a low income community in Contra Costa County that's a uh, very um, overly burdened environmental justice community. Chevron is kind of their anchor industry there. And we created this leadership program that really was trying to, that targeted the city council, the mayor, the city manager, which was not Fred. Um, and I, I you know, ran a really great program trying to expose them to equity issues and really tie, like they care about development, but how do you do it from an equitable development standpoint and get their peers from throughout the state to come and talk to them about, you really can move an equity agenda and be a policymaker, et cetera. And you know, while I thought we actually had some pretty good traction with that program, I think the evolution for me as an individual looking back at that time and you know, shortly thereafter was, you know, it was still in this position of trying to convince folks that are in power to understand why equity matters. And it was like, okay, how do you get the right people to have the conversation with them so that then they're not threatened and see their peer, which doesn't look like me, telling them what I'm asking them to tell them, you know? So, came out of that experience and then really had this aha moment, which was, you know, why are we not sitting at these tables? And that we should be the ones that are in these decision-making tables and leading for everyone. And so we ended up creating this Boards and Commissions Leadership Institute program that really focused on getting individuals of color and folks that represent a base that's impacted and marginalized um, onto local boards and commissions. And I think that both the aha moment from a self-reflection of just like, oh my gosh, it took eight years of running this organization to really get to the place where it's just like, we are the ones that should be, it shouldn't be around convincing. It's like, we have to find our folks and get them supported and then get them placed to be successful on these boards and commissions leadership institute. Around that same time, Fred, who was working in the um, San Francisco, running the redevelopment agency at the time, uh, called me and had said, you know, Mayor Newsom is looking for, which I will share with this group because we're among friends, somebody with your demographic to serve on. <laughs> A local commission and they don't know anyone so are you interested <laughs> and what was interesting is that I had thought that it would that he would end up coming back with a seat on the Planning Commission and because I'd been working on transportation housing land use issues my most of my career and 
the commission that they came back with was the Public Utilities Commission, which is our water power sewer department in San Francisco. And I can remember calling my friend who was running a labor council down in San Jose, and I was like, they're calling me about the water department. <laughs> and that she was just like, and I am a renter, so don't even pay my water bill. <laughs> and that she was just like, if you care about jobs and you care about the economy, that is the, it's an uh, enterprise department. They're not relying on the general fund. They're the biggest game in town around construction. And so went and were able to get uh, um, appointed and served on that commission for two years. And I think having the level of focus of you know, what can you actually move as a policymaker? And so really focused during the two years I was on that commission to get the utility to adopt an environmental justice policy, a community benefits policy, and really push the conversation around local hire, which resulted in the city creating a local hire ordinance, which was, you know, hugely exciting, I think. But the takeaway after being on there for two years was it's all about implementation. And so we passed the community benefits policy, passed the environmental justice policy, but it was never implemented. Um, and so two years after being on the commission, I came off the commission in this current role as assistant general manager, which really was to create this new community benefits program to implement the policies that we had passed. And you know, the implementation has been um, quite a learning <laughs> exercise because it's easy to throw stones from the outside of why don't they do that? And then when you're inside, you're like, oh my God, this is really hard. <laughs> That's why. Yes, I had that. I've had that moment. That's why I keep going in and out of government. I'm like, I really want to see why we're not getting stuff done. Oh, that's why. All right, but but we're we're gonna unveil all of that tonight. So Fred, I mean, see, you know, admit city administrator for Oakland, CEO of San Francisco Foundation, head of the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency. Is there a job that you have not had? <laughs> so you know, it, be, bring us into your story a little bit about your, your social justice connection and yeah. and and how you've been moving with it. Sure. Yeah. And thank you for the invite. It's uh, great to be here uh, this evening. My. Um, like Maya, my, my story kind of starts with um, my upbringing. Um, I have really been influenced in my career decisions and the, the jobs that I've been taking um, by my family and really two very different uh, familial experiences with my mother's side of the family and my father's side of the family. And I told this story a little bit earlier, but I'm going to tell it again. I'm, on my mother's side of the family, uh, it was a family full of advocates and teachers and nonprofit professionals. Um, my grandparents were teachers. Uh, my uncle was running a nonprofit in Oakland. My mom was uh, an advocate and also an organizer. Uh, matter of fact, you know, you'll appreciate this. I used to be that kid in the back of the room with the coloring book at the community meeting, wondering why everybody was so mad and when we could go home. <laughs> um, but really, I mean, and it, and it all it manifested itself. You know, my parents sent me to the school in Oakland that was founded and run by the Black Panther Party. And so from a very early age, um, I was really kind of bombarded with these issues of race and class and justice and you know, economic equality and all that stuff. It was just around me all the time. Uh, and it really became a, an important uh, frame of reference for me. Um, on my father's side of the family, very different. Um, my grandparents never really graduated from uh, middle school and they were from South Carolina. I think as, uh, as, as, as soon as they were old enough to leave, they did. Uh, and they moved to Harlem. Um, and my grandfather used to say two things to me almost all the time, and I'm really appreciative of the fact that I can say this in New York. One was, when you leave New York, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> and then the other thing he said, if it's not a Cadillac, it's not a car. <laughs> and, and for me, what that meant was that the Cadillac was the kind of ultimate symbol of making it in Harlem. And it was the, the representation that my grandfather really had this connection to community, connection to neighborhood, and where he was from meant a lot to him. Uh, and so, you know, I've had a lot of jobs, as you said. I mean, I've, I've um, done child policy work. Um, uh, I've done a lot of work in the public sector. I'm back in philanthropy. I've done that earlier. But all of those jobs have really been focused in on me, for me, on the, this intersection between kind of social, uh, and economic justice in place, uh, and neighborhoods as place where, places where all of that stuff uh, is brought to really high relief in terms of social injustice or economic inequality. And so that really has been the, the frame for me uh, in all the work. The only other thing I'll say is I've just been really blessed to have the opportunity uh, to be in positions where that's been able to be exercised. Um, one of the most profound things for me in, in the work that I've done uh, is when I first came to, uh, or went to San Francisco uh, to work in the Newsom administration uh, on a project called Communities of Opportunity. 
uh, and the mayor, among a lot of uh, pieces of his platform, was this notion that he wanted to get uh, the city service infrastructure to be more responsive to the most vulnerable children and families in the community uh, and in the city. And the first thing that we did was we looked at child welfare data, uh, juvenile probation data, children's mental health data, and we put it on a map. And it was the most striking thing that I'd ever seen. Half of the kids that had been removed from their homes, most of the kids that were in the child well, that were in the children's mental health system and the juvenile probation system were living within walking distance of seven street corners in, the San, in San Francisco. Six of the seven corners being in front of public housing, uh, and the seventh corner being at the intersection of Jones and Eddy, which is in the heart of the Tenderloin, for anybody who doesn't know um, San Francisco, which is basically Skid Row. Um, and so that, that exercise really kind of highlighted uh, what I talked about earlier, which is this intersection of opportunity and place. Uh, and we spent a lot of time working on uh, this initiative, which was really about uh, saturating these parts of the city with the kinds of services, uh, the kinds of connections and networks that we thought would lead to better outcomes for kids and families. And we can talk a little bit more about what worked and what didn't, but uh, that was just one of the more striking things of everything that I've worked on that kind of really highlighted this issue of that intersection. Thank you, Fred. So, Maya, you are uh, a council, are council to our new mayor here in New York City. And I see you with your two Blackberries. I remember the days when I was a presidential appointee. Was a this is called diversity. Once a I found it wonderful. <laughs> you know, you are always on call. You you sit at the at the right hand. Of, you're in you're in the air of the mayor. Um, so, were the opportunities to invoke change as you expected? Uh, you left uh, the Center for Social Inclusion, an organization which you were the president of, dedicated your life to social inclusion. Can you tell us a little bit about? Has it been possible? How successful? Are we able to use government as a change agent? So one is um, we're very able to use government as a change agent, um, and there are a lot of limits and a lot of battles. So you know both those things can be true. So for example, um, when and this really smart person told me this when I first talked. What's her name? She worked at the EPA. Anyway, I can't remember. Um, <laughs> but told me this when I took it. I was like, you know. Do stuff fast, um, because when you come in as in a new administration, I mean, okay, so my folks, my grandfather's South Carolina, and if you if you move to South Carolina and you're not from South Carolina, they call you a cumya. So you know, we're cumyas, right? I mean, to most folks in government, they're in government for as a career. And then a new administration comes in and you're a come ya. You're like, okay, you, you all came, you showed up, maybe you're here four years, maybe you're eight years, but at the end of the day, you'll be gone and I'll still be here. Um, and, and I, you know, ebb and flow with each new administration, and, which means that you come in, but you have this honeymoon period where you just get stuff done, right? Uh, and then you start to hit the period where things start to get harder. So if you think about what's been done in New York City, and I, and I will say I think these are not small things. I think these are pretty seismic things. <coughs> to come in and have changed paid sick days so that every employer that's f with five employees or more has to give 40 hours a week uh, paid sick leave. That's mostly low-income people because we're mostly talking retail service sector mostly people who are not making enough money to get by week by week. Uh, and that 40 hours actually is the difference often between either being forced to work or not working and therefore not being able to buy groceries at the end of the month. So it is not small and it's been a, hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers now going to get the benefit who were not going to get it before this administration. Um, secondly is universal pre-K. Uh, and you know, there are multiple reasons why universal pre-K is important, as you know, in addition to all the things the president has told you about the importance of educational opportunity. It's also economically important because families cannot, there are three reasons why New Yorkers cannot afford to live decent lives in New York. The first is uh, housing costs, the second is medical bills, and the third is childcare. So, uh, while it doesn't solve the child care problem, to have free universal pre-K seats available to any New Yorker, no matter their income, in their community, 
is also uh, a huge economic benefit to a struggling low-income community, uh, as well as the educational benefits that the child will, that the children will get. So, I mean, if you think about it, that's a those are structural shifts in my view because they're not just about a single opportunity or a single metric um, of investment in a family. It's actually those are multiple metrics of, of investments in, in in real people in ways that impact their their real lived daily lives. Um, and which, frankly, is universal, meaning it will benefit anyone in those jobs, but we know that it's really going to target particularly low-income communities of color, uh, just based on the demographics of it, who's included and who, who's excluded in the city. So those are not small things, and those got done very quickly, and we're not done. And we're moving on to after-school, universal after-school programs for middle school students. Um, we're looking at all kinds of creation of community schools, all kinds of things. So. One is I would say, you know, having a mayor who can, comes in and says, I'm going to be progressive, I'm going to be unabashedly progressive. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to make sure that, this, that the higher, at the highest levels of city government actually looks like the city of New York, with people who have actually experienced the lived experiences of people who live in the city of New York. I mean, it's just, I mean, I walk into a room every morning for a senior cabinet meeting. Um, there are 11 of us, 12 when the mayor is there. Six of us are women. Six of us are people of color. And that's out of 12. OK? Um, so it's no small thing. Um, now, ha having given you all that great news, uh, so to come yes, done come. <laughs> and now folks are going, wait, no, we can't do that. Because um, there's this reason and there's that reason. Uh, and so, you know, the, the calcification starts. Um, you also start to get the attacks from the media, right? Uh, you start to get, so everything starts rationing up because it's like a honeymoon period that ends. And so the trick becomes, I think, um, one, how to stay very focused on the mission, how to stay focused as a team, how to have real meaningful connections outside of government, which is, I think, the other thing that's really hard to navigate when you have to also constantly balance what government can do and what advocates want you to do. And, you know, having been on both sides of the fence, you know, sort of saying, I really need you to understand that this is a win. Uh, and I need you to trust that this is a win, right? And, but being able to have that authentic conversation, which says, and I know it's not all that we need or want. Um, and I'm going to tell you what, you know, and to, and to have that happen is something that I think we are now in the period of struggling with, right, as an administration, which is, that has very, very deep ties to the advocate, the progressive advocacy community, and is kind of looking at, now we've got to get very practical, look at how we push the envelope and push it hard, and recognize what we can get done, uh, and try to ask the advocates to be strategic with us, um, rather than to be purist. Thank you, Maya. Juliet, you're at uh, the Revenue Generation Center in a progressive city. Can you uh, let us in a little bit in terms of um, tools or opportunities, get down to the local level, tell us a little bit about what you've, how you've been able to invoke change? I feel like I'm in a therapy session. Yes, I'm just gonna absolutely. sit here with Maya and try to just hold hands. I'm just like, oh my god, I know. Um, <laughs> seriously, because I think a lot of your comments around urgency is right on the p on point with regards to the nose down to the grindstone of trying to push the change, knowing that everything is temporal, which obviously it is for all of us, regardless of whether in government or not. But I think that the urgency when you're really trying to move change in the public sector, there is that clip of how much can I get done and how do you institutionalize it <coughs> so that if I'm not there, there's enough embedded that, that it'll be hard to peel away. Um, so at the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, and again, just to give you a sense of scale, so we are a billion dollar agency, we have about 2,300 um, employees, and um, as we've looked at kind of the opportunity to implement the community benefits policy, it's really the first year and a half was really focused on um, setting the stage around implementation. So it was almost like what are the, how do you, set the table so that we can have some impact. And so what we ended up doing was bringing quite a few resolutions to our commission, so we have a five member um, commission, uh, to align resources um, to be under this community benefits program. So for example, the PUC is required by the city charter to set aside 2% of any above ground construction has to be spent for arts enrichment. 
And we do, again, a ton of, const of construction. We have $4.6 billion worth of construction happening on the drinking water side. We're getting ready to embark in a $2.7 billion rebuild of our wastewater system. All of that work will happen in San Francisco. So we end up generating, based on our arts requirement, you know, millions and millions of dollars every year um, for that purpose. Um, in the past, that money would go to the Arts Commission. We would just hand over the money to the Arts Commission, which is a sister agency, and that they would use it for public art, whether it's in front of City Hall or in lots of tourist area. And so what we did is take a resolution to our commission that realigned all of our arts enrichment dollars to be part of the community benefits program so that it's in places where we have our operations where we're having impact, that it allows us to put money into arts enrichment, not public art, into the schools that's supporting lo local artists. Um, which again is just how do you change the framework so that if I'm not there, if my, like, that this stuff is just how we end up doing our business. Um, one of the things that we've been really excited about that we're trying to scale up is on the contracting side. And so for many of us that have done nonprofit kind of advocacy work, you know, we've worked on community benefit agreements with developers um, wearing those hats from, from our past. And what anybody would tell you who's been worked, worked on community benefits work is that the lift that it takes to be able to get these community benefit agreements around development, I mean, is a heavy lift. It's years and years and hoping that the developer will sit down with you and that the political folks will force the developer to sit down with you and that you can have an organized base that stays to keep pushing and hammering the developer. What's been great at the PUC is, is we've really been looking at it from the perspective of what's this next generation of community benefits work? And I actually think that you know this policy and then the implementation has been it on, on the contracting side. You know, we do professional service contracts and we do construction contracts. Anything that's not the actual construction is professional services, just to for folks that don't do this work. We have now put requirements in that any professional service contract that we put out that's five million dollars or higher has a community benefit requirement, which is just great. And so that again, it's this new way of thinking that we don't have to be chasing after. It's the PUC saying proactively, we have a community benefits policy. When these RFPs go out that are $5 million or higher, we now have created boilerplate language that our contracts department just puts into the RFP that says, you know, bidders, we have this community benefits policy. You tell us at no cost to the PUC how you're going to help us meet our community benefits policy. Are you going to adopt a school? Are you going to let kids, you know, support youth interns over the summer? Or what are you, you know, are going to do ocean beach cleanup what, and some environmental stuff? And so the first contract that we put it in, again, to give you a sense of scale of impact, was a $150 million professional service contract. The bidder, the winning bidder um, committed to a million and a half dollars. Um, and to date, we've put it into 22 professional service contracts, been able to leverage $5 million. And again, it's stuff that I don't have to be there in order to hammer the contracts people or the engineers who are doing these projects. Uh, but it's just getting embedded into the level of work. Um, and it's, it's, I mean, I think your question about, like, what's, manifested itself and how has it not been realized. I think like if you really care about scale of impact, which is always what I was curious about from the nonprofit sector, is like, is the scale bigger on the public sector side? It's like, yes. <laughs> so I can say definitely yes, yes, yes. Because um, you're talking billions of dollars. Like over the summer, we ended up hiring 1,000 kids this summer. And most of those kids were black and brown kids. And it's just, you could never do, I could never have done that at, the, at a nonprofit level, and it's just the scale is so huge. We're putting $25 million to renovate a community center in a low-income community where we have our biggest um, wastewater facility, and the construction will start in that in the summer. So all of the numbers are so big, but I think that the challenge of how do you sustain this work, and I think Maya's comments about how do you create community outside of this to sustain it, and how do you get the advocates that were your allies and partners to show up, because once you go inside, they almost are like, go long, good luck, but it's um, the idea is that most of us are not going to be there forever, so how do you keep those connections as well and have a base that can carry this message on? So Fred, your uh, Blackberry no longer rings in the middle of the night when there's a fire or if something happens in, in the neighborhoods like a shooting, um, but could you tell us a little bit about some of the insights and tools or strategies that you put into place and all of your different responsibilities that you've had. Yeah, and there, you know, there are a number of things that were just mentioned that actually really um, resonate with me as well. I mean, the first thing uh, that I you know, tell folks all the time who are interested in kind of uh, policy, and particularly this kind of policy and having a leadership position in it, uh, is that it's a contact sport. Um, that you know, the, the folks who are the the advocates and the, the organizers and the people who are uh, proponents for the things that you think are right and that you work with them on uh, will never think that you went far enough. 
uh, you will find yourself yelling at your friends and having your friends yell at you. Um, and for the folks who are on the other side of the fence, they will always think you went too far. Uh, and so it is a lonely place uh, to be able to kind of figure out what that work is. And to tell you the truth, the approach that I've adopted is that I really hit the sweet spot when everybody's pissed off. <laughs> um, and so that's just one uh, piece of this. Um, I think the, the other thing uh, that's really kind of important for me, uh, at least, is that, you know, the uh, quote comes to mind, um, Winston Churchill, when uh, the Allies were in Normandy and won, uh, you know, said that uh, this is not the, the end or the beginning of the end, but it might be the end of the beginning. Um, and from a, a policy point of view, particularly when you're focused in on issues like this, that really resonates with me uh, because a lot of what happens is that we will get a win, uh, we'll get the council or we'll get the supervisors or somebody like that to vote affirmatively for something that we've worked hard on uh, and that's been, there have been a lot of blood, sweat and tears poured into, but the rubber really meets the road when you get to the implementation part of things. Um, and you, what has to happen at that point is you have to maintain that level of energy, that same level of um, uh, diligence um, and fortitude for a long time. Uh, and that is a very challenging thing to do. Without it, though, uh, the, the black box of year-to-year -year budget uh, decisions, the uh, political decisions that get made, uh, administrative priorities that get set um, will erode at that win. Uh, so for example, with stuff like community benefits policies, um, it's great to have it, but if it's not enforced, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, and enforcement takes infrastructure. It takes budget decisions. It takes um, staffing decisions that is gonna emphasize that component of the work. And if it doesn't happen, um, people are disappointed. Uh, the next time around, it's hard to get people to rally around uh, what you're doing and the results that you thought were going to be important don't come to uh, fruition. So, I, you know, that this issue of being able to um, stay connected to the constituency um, that kind of brought you that win is actually really important. People have to continue to show up and be present uh, at every step of the way. You uh, spoke about when the rubber hits the road. And when I was at the Environmental Protection Agency, one of our stated goals and concentrations was environmental justice. And um, we think that we made some strides in that. But then you also leave the agency and you wonder, OK, is it actually going to stick? And, and while you're there, while we were there, we had uh, a lot of people from the Senate saying, OK, you're here for everybody. You're not supposed to be just focusing on communities of color and low-income communities. So true, as a public servant, you are there for everybody. And how do you balance um, when the issues are in conflict in terms of being able to provide a social equity policy change and the fact that you are there um, for everyone? I'm going to start with Juliet this time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we get a lot of pushback around ratepayer dollars and that um, we need to have direct, direct nexus with what we spend with um, PUC overall benefit and that we can't use ratepayer dollars to subsidize or benefit a particular class of ratepayer. Um, yeah, and you know, it's a hard, I mean, I think that the organization, I mean, the San Francisco PUC is an organization that has um, a history and um, experiences where the mainstream has been less impacted than marginalized communities um, in San Francisco and in the region with regards to where we have our operations. And so I think that for me, both when I was on the commission and coming on as staff, um, the challenge has been, which is partly what the genesis was for the community benefits policy, was you know, community members came to the PUC commission when I was on the commission. Um, they're adjacent to where we're doing quarrying. And that um, our real estate team was presenting this lease where they wanted us to extend this quarry for a, about another decade. And that um, the quarry operator that was um, being recommended had negotiated a deal with a regional environmental organization. 
but that the Sonoli, Sonolians, the town of Sonol, Sonolians, um, had showed up at our commission meeting, a handful of them, and just said, you know, no one has come and met with us. And so as a commissioner, I was just like, I'm sure our real estate folks have met with the actual folks that live there and are being impacted. And it turns out they hadn't, and that they had negotiated this deal with this environmental organization that was really concerned about the environmental impacts and were able to get this pretty good um, mitigation around that, but that nobody had ever met with the Sonolians. And I had compared that at the time with the folks that were coming to, the, to our commission meetings on a regular basis from Bayview Hunters Point, which is where we have our largest sewer um, treatment facility, where it's a very organized um, neighborhood, and they show up at every commission meeting, even to this day. Um, hammering the PUC around kind of what's happening. But what's interesting around the community benefits policy is that that policy really, the genesis for the policy, everyone thinks who knows San Francisco that it was, it's based on the disproportionate impact that Bayview is having based on this wastewater facility. But the truth is, the genesis for it was the Sonolians, where it was just like, where you have a place where folks are not organized or don't have the infrastructure or a bunch of nonprofits that do advocacy or just regular folks living their life being impacted by us, the idea with the community benefits policy was it was supposed to put the onus on the agency. So it's on us to be able to seek out folks that are being overly impacted and that we need to figure out what the solutions are in partnership with them. Um, and you know that's the approach that I personally have used around the work is you know, most of our ratepayers are not being negatively impacted. But you know, when you look at places where we have our operations, across the board it tends to be in places where folks have less voice where it's more people of color, where it's lower income. And so, you know, we have, we say that our community benefits policy is throughout our service area, so it goes all the way up to Yosemite, all the way down to Santa Clara County. We've piloted a lot in San Francisco and Bayview um, and some stuff in um, Alameda County, but we always have this um, eye towards who does not have voice, how do we grab kids that are just disproportionately impacted? And that's why it's even when you look at the thousand kids that came through the PUC, it's just, it is a focus for everybody, but I think that the fact that we know folks in particular communities have not had access to paid employment with positive experiences, and for us, we see them as the next generation of workers because you know 40% of the workforce at the PUC will be eligible for retirement in the next five years. It's an old, aging workforce ready for retirement. For us, we see it as an opportunity. It's like, how do you, what should this utility look like in the 21st century, and how do we create these pipelines, starting with kindergartners and up, of folks being exposed to these are great paying jobs with pensions. If you care about communications, we have 22 people that just do communications and tweet and do all that stuff at our organization. We, if you care about policy, it's not just engineers. You know, high school degree is all you need for a lot of those jobs. And so really having an eye towards access for everybody, but knowing that we haven't done a great job in the past, so we're trying to have an intentionality around that. Just uh, one thing I wanted to, or a couple of things I wanted to add to this. I think one of the, um, most important challenges that we have as a, a field of people who are engaged in this kind of work mm -hmm. is to get folks to understand that uh, equal is not a synonym for equity. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and what I mean by that is that, um, you know, in a, in a lot of instances, um, in order to achieve equity, it actually takes uh, extra dosage of some of the interventions uh, that we think are important. And I just want to tell a couple of stories of, of this challenge. And, you know, it manifests itself everywhere. Um, when I was in Oakland, um, we really wanted to be data driven around our um, violence prevention uh, work. Uh, and what we found, and this was no secret throughout the city, was that the, most of the murders in Oakland were actually taking place in very compact parts of the city. It was East Oakland. It was between 73rd Avenue and, you know, 98th and, you know, MacArthur and East 14th Street in East Oakland. Uh, and so the notion was to uh, really have a place-based strategy around violence prevention that deployed not only uh, the police, but that was an important piece of it, but also deployed other uh, resources, whether they were human service related or, or whatnot. And, um, Everybody except for the place, the people who lived between 73rd and 98th Avenue was angry <laughs> because the, 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 the prevailing notion was that by saturating this neighborhood uh, with police protection, we were allowing burglaries and thefts to take place up in the hills in the more affluent areas. 
it had, that got to such a crescendo that we actually couldn't even implement the program because it was those people in the more affluent neighborhoods that had more political clout and had the ability to influence the policy makers not to go with a place-based strategy. Um, another example of this is the, just like I talked about uh, in San Francisco where we had this saturation uh, strategy for the areas where we know kids and families were struggling the most. Um, and again, uh, we ran up against the same kind of stuff. And I think for me, the way this has evolved and I think the way uh, that I come to think about it is that one is this is a physics issue. Uh, you know, if, if train A leaves Penn Station leaving, get going 25 miles an hour uh, and, and leaves at 12 o'clock, if train B leaves at 1 o'clock going 25 miles an hour, the train B is never going to catch up. And people tend to argue, you know, they get that. But the other piece of it, and my mom mentions this all the time, um, is that there's always this thought that if you have a universal system, that universal system that meets the needs of all, supposedly, will meet the needs of the most vulnerable. Um, and it's just simply not true. Uh, and what's, what's really true is that if you have a system that meets the needs of the most vulnerable, the, the needs of the all will be met. And we just have to be a little bit more articulate around how we lay that out. And one of the ways that, that um, I've heard recently that's talked about is curb cuts. Curb cuts were, you know, the, the disability movement was about we need curb cuts so that people on, in wheelchairs and other kinds of mobility disabilities will have access and be able to, you know, cross the street and do that safely. Um, but how many times do you go across or you walk in and you look in the neighborhood and you look in the city and you see lawyers with these big bags who are able to use the curb cuts to walk over? Or how many times have you seen a woman who uh, has a, a baby carriage who is able to use the, the curb cuts so that she doesn't have to go through a puddle? And how many other examples do we see where people who don't have disabilities are able to make effective use of the curb cuts? It's a great example of how meeting the needs of the most vulnerable will meet the needs of all. Maya, I really would like to hear from you on this subject as well. Uh, well I, I agree with everything that's been said. And I, what I would add is, you know, the way we talk about it, uh, uh, the, the example, New York has been, uh, and I've had to make these arguments nationally, but um, New York is a little bit easier just because 46% uh, of the New York City population is struggling to make ends meet. And when, <laughs> when you have that percentage of economic disadvantage and social disadvantage, it's the, you know, that zero sum game is not quite the same equation because uh, it's easier to talk about smart government and having limited resources and making sure you're targeting those resources in a way that makes sense. Um, all th the, only, the only place where we have seen, it's, it, but it's not to say there's no tension, right? So I think that the, the two tension points is one, um, we have seen, uh, for instance, folks who are wealthy in the city be very concerned about whether government is in this administration is going to be uh, a government that is representative of them because the mayor's rhetoric has been about the tale of two cities. Um, and so actually one of the things that, uh, that he did that I thought was very important was he started to talk about one city rising, um, which I think does go to Fred's kind of communications strategy, right? Which is saying, well, no, actually, you know, this is about making the whole city work uh, and th therefore that we're working together and it's one city rising up. So um, that way of talking about it's been very helpful. I, I will say that I think the thing that we tend to um, avoid uh, in, in how we think about how we address this is the way that race plays in to disadvantage, right? So the, the, the notion if you, you actually um, think about what's happening, and I, I'll give an example. My, my local uh, elementary school where my daughter goes, which is a neighborhood elementary school, which is extremely diverse and historically very diverse, but not with students who are white. Um, in, in other words, there's 157 language groups from South America and from the Caribbean and from Asia. Um, and very, very few students, although 25% of the neighborhood is white. Um, that's been changing as people have discovered that the school is a working school. 
when originally when they didn't think it was a working school was largely because of the demographics. Actually, nothing's really changed in the academic achievement of the kids in the school. And I can say that because I have a 13 year old who's, who went through and finished there. Now I have a 10 year old there. Um, but, but the perception has changed of the school. And as the neighborhood is gentrifying and more and more uh, parents who are white are willing to send their kids there, the school realized they had to eliminate, they decided to eliminate the gifted program. And the reason they did that is because they were starting to see segregating in the classrooms, despite the diversity in the building. Um, but n n it became a really big fight, in part because the difficulty in talking about investing in, in, in our most precious resources uh, uh, being our people, but also recognizing that we're not all situated exactly the same, even if we all are experiencing different forms of, of exclusion. And you know, so we, there are many, many reasons why every New Yorker who wants or needs to have a child in public school sees that as a, as a vital asset that's not necessarily present enough. And that's real no matter your middle class, you're struggling to make it in this city because <laughs> it's expensive, because it's hard to find a good public school that you're willing to send your kid, you know, right? Um, so then when you start layering on, though, how that's different for different kids based on whether they're English language learners, whether they're uh, first generation immigrants, um, whether they're third generation, right? These are, and depending on where they're coming from and what their parents do. Um, my daughter, when we were walking to, to school one day, said to me, Mommy, all the white kids live in houses. And I said, and what she meant the kids in her school. And I said, yup. And she said, all the brown kids live in apartments. And I said, pretty much. And she said, that's not fair. Um, and that is a structural condition that actually we have to be able to talk about in order to talk about the investments and to be to talk about how it actually will improve public schools for everyone. Um, and I do think that one of the things that has been happening more and more is people's ability to have that conversation better, which is to say, have it in saying we all have to do better, we all need better outcomes, um, that actually we have a society that's not working very well for most of us, the, in fact, the vast majority. Uh, and the, and what, how we do that and what it looks like is not the same across every single demographic group, and we have to be able to confront that based on race and history. Thank you. So um, we have two discussants that I would like to call to the front here, uh, two esteemed professors from Milano. Uh, who, which gentleman will be first? <laughs> Carson, Jerry, Jerry. Rick, come on up. Rick McGehee is a professor in urban policy. Please bring a chair up and join us. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Surprise guess. Mm -hmm. Surprise guess. So, Rick, we will start with you. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this is a great discussion. I wish it could go on. So, uh, there are a lot of things I'd like to talk about. Let me focus in on a couple. I, I, I very much wanted to talk about the government issues. I uh, was Assistant Secretary of Labor under President Clinton when Alexis Herman was the Secretary. and. I was Senator Kennedy's economic advisor, so I know very well these painful <laughs> feeling of you're in there, you're trying to get something done, and how little you seem to be able to get done. But I, I want st to, I'm, I'm doing work now actually on what cities can do on their own to address inequality, particularly on economic issues. So I want to I talk a little bit about community benefit agreements actually, which I do a lot of work on. I was in Los Angeles this summer visiting at USC at Manuel Pastor's Center on, on that. And then step back from that a little bit and, and, and reflect in a little bit. So um, community benefits uh, agreements, I think they're folks are well described. If you get something from the city, particularly in economic development, you ought to give something back and it ought to be enforceable and you ought to be able to make sure that you get it. And I have to say that California, most of the cities are ahead of us in New York on this for a whole bunch of reasons we don't have time for. Mayor Bloomberg didn't like them. Uh, the city historically goes deal by deal. <laughs> And there are limits to what the state government will let the city do. But I think the, the, the thinking, the really creative thinking about what the cities do at scale and how you can leverage that 
for these equity purposes. Los Angeles is changing the way they pick up garbage. It couldn't be anything more prosaic than that, but it's harnessed to strong equity provisions about job creation, about environmental uh, uh, improvement, about more recycling to create new industries for jobs. Uh, so there's a lot of creativity there from that, and uh, the San Francisco stories are great ones. There's a lot of this happening. Uh, New York's beginning to look at it. I hope we can do more of it. That's in this, but then we have this paradox, right? We, have, we can all find these innovations around the country, these islands of innovation on particular things, but yet we're living at a time at the same time when national policy seems to be going the wrong direction on most of these issues. Spending's cut, uh, Washington's deadlocked, we haven't got much hope of getting things uh, out of there. State and local spending is down still for after the Great Recession. It knocked a huge hole in state budgets. They still haven't come back in their spending levels or the number of jobs they create. So uh, these hopeful stories of, of innovation, which are great, are taking time at a context when uh, our resources are actually worse than they've been for quite some time for cities. I don't have a solution for that, but, but I want to point that out. Uh, the innovations are great. I think part of that is that, that localities, what we're seeing explore, are people are finding ways to bring groups together that haven't worked very well together in the past. And the three that, that I think are particularly telling in the community benefit story are uh, the communities of color, which we talked about here and have to be central to any of our thinking about equity, but two groups that you don't always think of as being involved on in equity issues, and that's environmentalists and, in some cases, labor unions. These are all groups that want things out of the gun. They all need a strong government to get things. None of them can get what they want by themselves. They are simply aren't powerful enough. And, but that also is, doesn't mean they can just all sit down and magically have a solution together. There are all these community benefit stories, everyone here would tell you, have taken enormous, difficult, hard day-to-day -day work, even just to negotiate them, much less to implement them and make sure that they come through. But those are the things that seem to be sticking and working in cities. It's a real innovative period in, in cities that care about equity uh, in doing that. And so to build and maintain those alliances is a huge challenge. I think that's where this change is going to rise up nationally. And finally, uh, Maya said, and it really has to be pointed out, we can't deal with this without thinking about problems of race and exclusion. I'm, I, this writing I'm doing on cities, I have three case studies, New York, Los Angeles, and Detroit, and if you want to see a place that's just paralyzed by racial problems, go to Detroit. Everyone knows the city's population, Detroit, has, has plummeted. The region's population, which most people don't know, has actually grown. The Detroit region is not that unprosperous. It is all concentrated in this cratered city. It is also the most ra racially segregated uh, metropolitan area in the United States, bar none. Uh, Eight Mile Road is the division. You can actually see it when you map it out. So uh, again, to, that we can't shy away from that issue as hard as it is for us to find ways to talk about it. Detroit cannot come back that region cannot come back until they find some way, uh, and it's not just Detroit, we all have this, to grapple with that fundamental problem of racial division. So I thought it was really great that that was called out uh, and made um, important. So cities have to keep talking to each other as well as doing things at home. Mayor de Blasio is leading this task force for the U.S. Conference of Mayors, which we hope you know, we'll have some great results and spread these. Uh, innovations, uh, and I just, this was a, an inspiring talk to listen to people who are really in the trenches but haven't lost that social vision, and I count Michelle in there too because she's been uh, on, on these two sides of the social justice and the governmental side, so I found it really uh, a thoughtful and inspiring panel. Thank you, Professor McGahey. Professor Hamilton. So, can, uh, unless we're being recorded, I'll try to project my voice. Can I do that instead? You are. You, we are being recorded. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Props. <laughs> All right. Um, so let me let me start by saying that first off, I'm I'm very pleased to have a dean that has taken as her initiative this whole idea around social justice with the curriculum and the school as well. Um, we have as a school have a tradition of social justice at the new school, um, and Michelle is bringing in her experience both in the private sector, the public sector, um, to and also she's not. She's not um, skating around the issue of race. She's taking it right on. And given the trends of what we see, I think we need that. I think we need a cor courageous leader who's going to talk about poverty and also take on issues around race as well. Um, and, it, and it fits well with the lens of students when they come to Milano. So this course that she initiated, um, it almost is a, is a branding course of, of defining what Milano is. I think this panel itself is a definition of what Milano is. 
Um, I'd also say that I'm, I'm very pleased uh, that uh, she chose to invite both Fred and um, both Fred and Juliet. And Juliet is helping lead this course. They're working in the trenches. They're doing things where I sit on my privileged academic perch and talk about ideas. Um, but they're, in a lot of ways, more courageous than me. And I, I, I congratu congratulate them and happy to actually learn from them. And then finally, I reserve Maya for last because I don't think she knows the profound influence she's had on me over the years in general. I, I first met her when we both were on a panel together. And um, some people might say, well, Derek, you're humble. It's not really true. I, 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 <laughs> I'm not that humble. I often think I, I know a lot of, <laughs> I, also, I also think I know a lot when I went into a room. But I, there was, I was in awe just sitting with her in her presence and that, and that. But over the years, I continue to learn from her. You won't get to hear the full gamut of what she does. But if you want to know how to brand race in a way that is, that is appealing to the masses, Maya has an excellent strategy to do so. Um, if you want to, there's more I can go into, but I know I'm running out of time, so I, you, you all want to hear something important beyond praising. So let me, let me get to the point. Um, I, I'm good with praise. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I thought of Fred's success metric and everybody hating me. <laughs> oh, I got something for you in here, too. <laughs> no, I, I think we, you know, clearly we need some policy that's transformative. You know, we, we see the news, we see the popularity of Peckety's book. Uh, we are, we've had a crisis, and rather than a reverse of that crisis towards a more egalitarian society, we continue to expand into more and more unequal society. Um, we need something dramatic and transformative. I actually think the real solution has to come at the federal government le level, but um, there are things we can do that are transformative at the local level as well, and they are indeed engaged in them, and I'll, I'll suggest a couple also while I'm here today. Um, but let me also just start off with, I was writing down something right before this talk, and I'd say that we live in a capitalist society that excludes segments of the population from access to capital. And frankly, that's a cruel society that simply locks in inequality. If you want to have a capitalist society that's a meritocracy, people will need access to capital so that they can, have, they can play out their human capabilities. So that if I have this great entrepreneurial idea, without capital, it's irrelevant. If I want to um, be a great scholar and be transformative in, in creating cures for cancer, if I don't have capital and access to an elite university, it's irrelevant. Um, and also, we want people to have economic security, to have opportunity and freedom over their life so they have agency. So we, we, I think we would desire to even if we, if we want to have a meritocracy and capitalist society, to give people access to building capital. Um, I'd say that um, I'm going to name a couple of ways today. Uh, we need to invest more in public goods. And I'm not just talking about traditional infrastructure public goods, which we surely need, building more bridges, um, shoring up the bridges we have, shoring up the roads we have. Um, we have a crumbling infrastructure that's well documented by the Civil Society of Engineers, so there's plenty of work that can be done in there, to, done in that area to put people to work. But we also need to be creative and talk about human capital infrastructure building as well. We can build around schools, we can build around hospitals, and I'm sure there are bright people who have run nonprofit organizations that can determine need that we also need to build with, with regards to our public goods. And these public goods create public assets. Right, a key thing that I'm talking about today is assets. We need individual assets, and we also need public assets. So we need, to, we need some policy that's going to lead to a focus around that. Right, we've, we've had a trend towards privatization. We've been starting to privatize things like schools, things like prisons, um, and we know that from economic theory, they create perverse incentives. You're going to have supplier-induced demand where you create perverse incentives that aren't ultimately good for society. It's no wonder we're trending towards the, why we have the prison industrial society as we, as we divest towards, divest public interests and, 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 uh, and build up pu public, private interests in building prisons, for example. Um, we can uh, think about things like federalizing credit scores. Why should we privatize something like credit scores that's, that's so determined in individual lives and what they have access to? Why can't we have transformative policies 
not, not just transformative, but transparent, that was the word I was looking for, transparent policies around what goes into a credit score and how we even evaluate somebody's credit worthiness. If I pay my rent on time all the time, shouldn't I get credit for that? If, if I don't have access to a mortgage payment? Well, if we had a federal government that was involved in this, perhaps we could design a mechanism that, that's more inclusive. Um, I'll, it, going back to, to Maya, I know uh, Maya's working on providing people with access to broadband and, and she can more eloquently describe what she's doing, but why not have Wi-Fi publicly provided? Why can't we have free Wi-Fi for everybody? Wouldn't that be more efficient than having individuals contract with individual employers to deliver their Wi-Fi? If you want the high-speed Wi-Fi, perhaps you can engage in a, in, a, in a private contract, but why not provide public access to Wi-Fi for everybody? Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is seed money to build capital, right? We want to arm people with economic security so that they can have determination over their life, right? We, and I can think of examples. Historically, some of us might remember Mitchell Lama Apartments. Anybody remember Mitchell Lama? Yep. We created a wealth class with Mitchell Lama. We gave some middle-income individuals access to neighborhoods like Brooklyn Heights, and there were restrictions on what they could do with that that asset for a while, um, but eventually they, they were a millionaire class. They had access to a million dollar asset, well over a million dollar asset. Well, why can't we come up with something like that for people who are renters um, in certain neighborhoods? That could help stem some of the tide of gentrification. What if we identified people that lived in a neighborhood for X years ago and were still resident in that neighborhood and we provided them with access to purchase a, a home in a neighborhood rather than, rather than rent but pay a mortgage with, at the same level that they were paying, right? We can have the, the city could even finance some of these projects directly. And if we're worried about shirkers, if we can think of schemes similar to how universities do. If I were employed at Princeton University, they recognize that their employees can't afford their, the neighborhood of Princeton to purchase a home, but they have arrangements set up where the university subsidizes faculty to get housing in Princeton University. And if the faculty decides to leave and wants to, wants to benefit from this large appreciation, well, Princeton University gets a cut of that appreciation, at least for a certain period of time. We could come up with schemes like that with the, with the public sector to give people access to, to building up at wealth and, and economic security. So I think I'll close on that. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to our provocative scholars from Milano to put us in this place, which is the place is we have an opportunity for questions and answers now. Um, you know, this has been an East Coast, West Coast conversation. I mean, it's, it's an honor to be able to have representatives from uh, you know, arguably the, the two most important cities, but definitely progressively important cities. And, you know, there are definitely st uh, strategies and schema that, uh, that our guests have been putting in place. So I I ask you to, to test them a little bit, ask them about some of the things that they've been doing. So we, do we have, uh, you need to take, this, yeah, I'll take another one, there we go. Okay, let's start with the uh, young lady in the front here, and then we'll go. Hello. Um, so I have a question specifically for Maya. I work in New York City government in a policy development agency, which will remain nameless. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, let's say the rooms I'm in are not as diverse as the ones you're in. I also come out of social and environmental justice into a space where I'm likely the only one. Uh, so conversations are really difficult. One of the things that has happened in a new administration is we have new language. So everyone's talking about equity with no definition okay, for yeah, what right, that is. Right. <laughs> and one of the things I, I do uh, wonder is if there is any discussion about how to get some new ideas to the staff level, mm -hmm. you know, even if it's at the decision-making staff level, mm -hmm. uh, because I know city staff is very large, but specifically in the economic development mm -hmm. line of agencies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now I know. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's yes. sorely needed. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, the very, very important questions. Um, let me preface by saying we actually have 10 free wireless corridors, and if I, if I have my way, we're going to have a few more. Uh, so I agree with you on that point. Um, this is a very important point. So, uh, one, 
Um, the one of the things that we're actually working actively, one of the things that happens is because people came in so fast, you know, came in with a very, very big agenda with the mayor. I don't know if, all right, I'm gonna say this. And if, <laughs> and if I get fired, it's on y'all. Um, having been in the Dinkins administration, which was the last Democratic administration in the city since until this one, uh, and, and having the strategic analysis that one of the mistakes of the Dinkins administration was not being fast and aggressive early on, right? So coming in saying we'll be fast and aggressive and hit hard on and, and be very clear, we're going to reverse stop and frisk, we're going to get universal pre-K, we're going to, you know, there were just these very specific high-level things and, and required multiple agencies uh, and trying to put commissioners in place to do that. So one of the things that that means, though, is you're not taking the time then to, then to drive a culture down into the institutions, right? Because you're making the strategic analysis that what you're trying to put in place are the policies that are going to actually impact people's lives. And so now we're kind of getting to that point, uh, and we convened all of the agency heads at Gracie to actually talk about our definition of, and we were using, it's, it's interesting what's happened, because I came in being from the racial equity field with everyone talking about equality and me saying equality is not equity. Uh, I want equity, not equality, because there are a lot of poor white folk, and no offense, I don't want to be poor with y'all. <laughs> like so, because that could be equal, um, and that's not my goal. Okay, so, you know, we're actually talking, so when we talk about having to invest in communities of color and actually think about how demographics, it's not like if we have 40% un uh, unemployment, but it looks the same demographically, we're okay. So, so, so we had this conversation about how we were starting to think about our definition, um, but, and that's happened, and actually uh, uh, all the agency heads were all reconvening actually tomorrow at Gracie for the second meeting. But I say that to say it's kind of starting at the same time that um, the mayor's identifying the kinds of policy discussions he wants to make sure is happening in the agencies. One of them is whether the agencies look like the city of New York. Uh, and the, uh, at, at obviously starting at senior leadership level because that's where you have control. Um, but I think then also with the policy conversations about one of the things that he has charged me with is we're, sp I have two, two areas, but they're interrelated in my view. So one is I'm his MWBE director, right? M minority and women owned businesses. Why? Because talking about, uh, if you actually want to think about something cities can leverage, who, not just what they're spending dollars on, but who they're giving those dollars to when they're spending. Because one of the things that we know from national research is that the folks, the businesses that go out into communities of color where there is high unemployment and higher are more likely to be minority business enterprises. So the more money you're spending on those enterprises, the more likelihood you're also getting a job leverage in addition to, right, uh, in terms of how you're spending your money. Uh, one of the conversations about the union relationships. Um, there's a tension there because a lot of the MWEs are not union shops. And so unions saying, wait, and we value unions and collective bargaining and we value investing. So these are things, and they are highly racialized and gendered then, right? Because the construction trades is, as Derek has taught me over the years, uh, actually does not look demographically like the city of New York. And in fact, many of the folks that work in the labor unions don't live in the city of New York. Um, that's not to say we don't want folk, we want folks in unions and we want the collective bargaining and we want uh, all those folks who are in the construction trades working and we also want to see those ladders of opportunity. Um, so I'm saying all that to say these are the kinds of conversations we're having in terms of what all of the agencies should be doing to contribute to the jobs that city spending is creating being impactful for communities in New York that need jobs, as well as ensuring then that uh, minority and women-owned businesses are benefiting sufficiently. And I would say the third piece to that, which we have to think about, is how we get those businesses to scale. Because the reality is most of them are small, and, and that's not in and of itself a bad thing. It's just that when you start to look at the spend and the leverage, 
the big bucks require big, big operations. And so a lot of the times when you see the award dollars being too low, it's because those shops aren't big enough. And the last thing I just want to say, because I think it is important that I think the West Coast has been significantly more innovative than the East Coast in a lot of the things that we've been talking about. The, a couple of things I want to point out is because state policy has been more innovative because state policy has a big impact on what cities can do. If you look at New York, home rule. So when we talk about universal pre-K, right? The fact that the mayor says, I can pay for that investment in that social infrastructure if you let me tax folks making $500,000 or more, which I as a mayor don't have the authority to make that decision. And the governor says, nope. So you'll have a partial rollout of UPK. Now, governor had his reasons. I'm not attacking the governor. I'm just saying when you look at some of the innovative policies out of California, you also have to look at what state has allowed cities to do. The other thing I want to say is New York, New York City, the size of this government, the size of the Department of Education by itself is a city. New York, no, I'm serious. It's like a city. I'm like, you know, I could not sure I could run that. Um, it, if you actually look at the size of New York, if we were a, st if we were a state, we'd be 13th in the nation. And we are as big as Los Angeles, Chicago, and Houston combined. Innovating in government and, uh, and, and doing one of the things that, that innovation requires is government to work in a de-siloed way. Well, when, you're gover when your one agency is the size of a city unto itself, it is not a small task. I don't say that as an excuse. I wouldn't be in city government if I didn't think of it as an, a tremendous opportunity. I only say that to say, Context matters, the challenges in New York are not insignificant, and we are very committed to having that impact. Gentlemen, then you had your generous. Uh, my name is Lewis Harrison. I'm um, a host of an NPR radio show called um, That Was Then, This Is Dow. Um, and I like that he spoke about capitalism a little bit, not because I'm such a great capitalist but because it seems that in a market-driven economy, even if it's an oligarchy, he's really the only one who really even brought that up. So I wanted to plant the seed if I could. I interviewed a guy named Christopher Alexander who developed a body of work called Pattern Language. It has to do with urban, urban planning, but when I talk to urban planners, no one's ever heard of the guy. When I talk to architects, everybody's heard of the guy. So there's definitely a disconnect between the people who plan what gets built and how it gets built and the people who actually do the building. And so if you just want to make a note of that in your mind, Christopher Alexander, he's very influential. He's the first person to ever get a degree in architecture at Harvard, a PhD. In, and uh, he's way out there and very influential on, on every level of, of urban planning except for those in, go in government. So whenever I talk to government people, Never heard of the guy. When I talk to independent entrepreneurs, even building in middle and low income housing, everybody knows who he is. So you can wiki it, you know, pattern language. This is, this is good food for thought. And you know, I'm going to turn to our redevelopment, community development expert here, Fred, to uh, give us a little bit. So, uh, you know, I'm so glad that you brought up uh, cap capitalism and, and, and um, the, the intersection between the economy and equity. And, and I'll throw in another thing, race. Um, and that is this. Uh, it see, it, what I'm excited about, to tell you the truth, is that folks are kind of coming to terms with some things that are really kind of facts in, in this country. Um, one is that uh, people of color uh, are rapidly uh, working towards becoming the majority. Uh, and uh, that demographic shift uh, is important in this conversation. It's important for a couple of reasons. One is that if you look at uh, educational achievement gaps, health disparities, environmental justice issues, people of color are being left behind. So what does it mean that the folks who are going to be the majority at some point are the same people that are today being left behind? And more importantly, what does that mean for our economy? What does it mean for our economy that uh, the folks who are uh, experiencing some of the worst outcomes in terms of uh, education uh, and performance in the schools, what does it mean in terms of 
that, that, that health disparities means that people uh, who live in Oakland, for example, uh, if you are born today in West Oakland, you're probably likely to live about 14 years less uh, than a, a, the same person who's born in the hills. What it means is that we are moving swiftly to a place where this country will no longer be a competitive country on an economic scale. Uh, and so what folks, I think, are certain, starting to realize, and what I'm very excited about is that this conversation about equity has now made itself its way into the writings of Standard & Poor's uh, in the writings and discussions at the Fed Reserve. So folks are starting to understand that uh, achieving an equity agenda is within their self-interest, whether or not they're in a room like this or come from a progressive background like I do. So I'm so happy that you raised it. We didn't have the opportunity to talk about it. But the future is looking a lot, not looking very good unless we get this equity thing right. So, really quick, I, I think that's a slippery slope and almost dangerous. Um, I think there's an alternative way to view things. Um, I think that uh, one, the the definition. I'll say this, and then some people are going to say, "Wow, Derek said this." Ultimately, <laughs> it's ultimately it's about in groups and out groups, not necessarily race. That the definition of white is shifting. What, the, what it means to be the in-group and what it means to be white might not be the same today as it is tomorrow. Um, so I think we, we, that, that is an argument to make, and, and it very well may be true, but people literally could come, people can come up with counter-arguments. For example, through immigration, we could, we could bring in other demographics. There, there are ways to get around that, and we know that, um, well, I won't go into details. I'll just get, uh, get to the point. I think the real argument is we, Rather than focusing so much on growth and income, we really need to focus on a definition of building human capabilities, the, the stuff that came out of people from people like Amartya Sen. We really want to have a society where people can reach their full potential almost regardless, one that's inclusive. Um, and, and, and if we use that definition, it becomes re irrespective of what the definition of white or the in-group is. It'll just be transformative throughout time. The one thing I would just add as far as thinking about the economy and kind of a practical, as we're getting ready to put $2.7 billion to rebuild our sewer system, is that you know we have done everything from, you know we're working with another university, which shall remain nameless as we're remaining nameless today. Um, but it sounds like uh, to do a value chain analysis of the $2.7 billion that we're going to spend to really be able to look downstream of, and that we talk about this a lot internally of, if we know that we're going to need 8 million paper clips to build the new sewer plant, you know, how do you both identify that at the front end before, you know, years before the construction is going to start so that you can actually support smaller businesses being able to say, if I knew that we needed 8 million paper clips over 15 years, I would create a paper clip business <laughs> and be located in that community because as an MBE, I would have um, access. And so I think that some, especially in the public sector side, because we are an economic engine, it's like 2.7, but we also get, it's like the trickle down idea does not work. And so the intentionality of, we actually ha have to have real information about what are we gonna need to build? And then how do you create and support incentives around procurement to ensure that the money goes where we want it to go? And that in addition, we've created a contract assistance center that really is focused on what Maya was talking about. And again, it's happening now and it's already been opened in that community where we're saying, you know, how do you build the capacity of smaller contractors to bid competitively for PUC or any other citywide work? And so really having this targeted focus with this economic inclusion and opportunity framework that's running alongside, that we've developed, that's running alongside of this $2.7 billion of investment where you're saying, here's what success will look like for us. And it's not just about building a new facility. It's with these education metrics. It's around place-based investments. That we're, it's around contracting. It's around jobs. Um, so we can hold ourselves accountable. The community can hold ourselves accountable. Thank you. Okay. So it's it's eight. So I'm going to take two more quick questions. And you've had your hand raised up. So mine is actually more comment than a question, having worked in government for a lot of years and been MBEs. And I, I support a lot of what people are saying. But um, I just want to say, you know, a lot of the, the stuff about MBEs is that they seem to work much better in terms of race than they do with gender. So if you hire um, women-owned businesses, they 
are going to provide the same kind of employees as any male-owned business so that business owner becomes richer but it doesn't ch have the same impact so it's a, it actually is not the same program regardless of how you roll it out but when you go to the businesses themselves what they really want is the business the contracts to be cut into smaller amounts to get the checks up front or much faster there are a lot of things you can do to make those people successful even if you can't um, even if, if you can't get them to capacity build. And the capacity building is, I think, much harder than structuring some of this stuff in ways that allow MBEs to compete better. I, just, mm -hmm. I, I, I agree with that, and I want to make one point. There are women who are people of color. And so <laughs> one of the, right? So, so we just need to be a little bit explicit about that because, uh, because I think you're making a fair point. And, it's, uh, and if, as like all things, it's also more complicated. And some of the women of color construction companies in the city that I've sat down with are run by a black woman and a Latina. And they're at the larger scale, interestingly enough. And, and they actually do. But I think, you, I, but I also agree with you. So there, so so uh, yes, and one of the things that, as you know, I mean, one of the things that I think is, and we, we should really lift this up because the the construction skills program, which um, is one of uh, uh, the most successful at seeing taking a high school student of color uh, and getting them a sixty-seven thousand five hundred dollar a year job, right, in a, through an apprenticeship program. Um, those are the kinds of programs, though, and very, very successful uh, over the past 10 years. But over the past 10 years, we're, t we're, still, only, we're still only talking about 1,000 kids, right, or 1,500 kids. So part of it is taking that to scale, but also then making gender a much, much more active part of that, right? So I think that's why I say I agree with you. And also, we, we also, I'm, I'm just impressed by the, the women businesses that I'm starting to see, and some of them being at the larger scale, so. Just you go. 30, 30, 30 seconds on this. Um, this is another example where state policy makes a difference because Juliet and I live in the land of Proposition 209 which means that we cannot use minority and women-owned business policies. What we have to do in order to do the, the local stuff is to do local and small local uh, contracting and hiring policies. And I just wanted to add, I mean, your points around some of the low-hanging fruit, which are true barriers, which prompt payment, the fact that folks have to wait four months, the, and these are the subs, and that's if there's who can cash flow that. And so, again, I think what we are looking at within the PUC is a pilot program with a bank where we would put up the, you know, so if the prime signs off and says the work is done by the sub, the sub can just go take the piece of paper to the bank and get paid. But those types of things plus a debunk, those are the low hanging ones where I appreciate that. These are great examples of all this implementation stuff. It is really mm -hmm. hard. Tricky. Okay, so I'm coming back to this side, this gentleman, for the last question. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Victor, Victor Madibuko. I'm the CEO of Career Nation. I'm a class of uh, Milano class of 2001. I'm yeah, very proud. Yeah, Victor. <laughs> very pl proud of the education that I got here, and uh, this course on uh, economic and social inclusion is timely, and is very important. And as I sit down here and I listen to our distinguished uh, panels, I said. Here are folks who are doing high level stuff. And I wondered to myself, uh, does this course, and, and this question goes to uh, Dean uh, and to the professors, does this course have uh, a global element that can uh, produce uh, this kind of uh, folks uh, so that they can uh, take this learning back to their respective countries and be able to organize and be able to uh, uh, impact their community. I, I know, I have no doubt about the quality of education here because it took me uh, five years upon graduation to go from intern to director level position here in the city. So the question is, does the curriculum have the international piece tied to it so that foreign students can take this uh, uh, back to their respective countries? 
That's a fantastic challenge, uh, Victor, and I thank you for raising that. Um, this is the, and it leads me into the closing. So I know a lot of people are hungry. I mean, we, we could have stayed here and had another two hours of discussion. Never worry, because this is actually a little insight into the course that we'll be having uh, next semester. And if you're not a student, you're wondering, okay, how can I get more of this? Well, never worry. We're going to have, <laughs> and seven of the 13 classes are going to be partnered with public lectures. So we will continue to have distinguished guests and those that have been implementers and are implementing now, <coughs> or, <coughs> excuse me, or scholars that will be continuing this conversation um, for the entire course uh, next semester. Now, Victor raises the international piece. Of course, Milano is, has shifted over the years, and Milano now is the School of International Affairs, Management, and Urban Policy. So earlier on, those of us that are part of the, uh, of the course were actually discussing how we could bring in some of our international affairs scholars to be able to be discussants, to bring out and lift up some of those opportunities to be able to learn from a domestic, primarily a domestic agenda and conversation, but to seek out what opportunities there are to be able to cross-learn. We all need to be learning from each other all of the time. So I want to thank the panelists here and the discussants and the audience. This has been the fulfillment of a dream, really, and I think that um, we're very excited to have an entire semester long conversation with you around these issues and to go deep and to be able to bring out the solutions. So thank you for coming tonight.